thank you very much. My name is Guy Greers. I'm an old man now, but in my 20s I was tough like all you young kids here. I was full of energy, full of life. I was a soldier in a far off country called Vietnam. There was a war over there. Many remember this war, but generally the older generation, a lot of the people who have been born since don't know it except from the history books, but I know it because it made a big effect in my life. The prison experience was the greatest blessing that there ever was for me in my life by God. A terrible experience, but a wonderful, wonderful blessing for me, spiritually, which is the only thing that really matters in the long term. I was 24 when I left this country to fight in that war. I came back when I was 30 years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right ahead, ma'am. I'm sorry. If I'm getting away, just to say something. You know what I mean? Okay. I attended the Air Force Academy in Purdue University, and then I went to learn how to fly fighters. I learned how to fly jets and then fighters. That took about two years. It's quite a long uh, training process. By that time, I had two children with Sandy, my wife. I wanted, to, with all my heart, to fight in that war and stop the communists there. They had a theory of taking all these little countries. Finally, after they took all the resources of the world, Europe and the United States would fall like ripe apples in their hands. That's what they believed. And they were taking, you know, country after country. And I volunteered to fight because I'd been a big, big student in military history. And I'd seen what happened to civilian populations when you got armies going through a country. I didn't want any part of that for my wife and children. You know, everybody gets dislodged. Wherever the armies are fighting, everybody just leaves their homes and everything else and gets out of the way because there's so much firepower being traded between the armies. It puts everybody in a refugee mode and it's a horrible thing when you're, when you're on the road with only what you can carry and you've got kids and all that kind of things. Communism had spread all over by that time. This was about 20 years after World War II. We were in what we called a cold war with them because it wasn't a fighting, it wasn't a shooting war, it was a cold war. They were building up their weapon systems for a nuclear attack on us and we had a counter strike capability for a nuclear strike back on them. You know, if they hit us, we were going to hit them. It was called mutually assured destruction. It was a, a very bad situation to be in. There were thousands of nuclear bombs targeted for release by missiles and bombers on a momentary, virtually momentary launch basis. Uh, our forces were on 15 to 30 minute alerts because that's the only time you had when a ballistic missile was launched inbound. You know, you could pick it up about 15 to 30 minutes uh, up in the air as it's coming in at 18,000 uh, miles an hour from uh, halfway around the world. So you had to always be ready, always ready to fight a major world war. There was no time to build up. You had to be ready to fight. At this time now, they had taken North Vietnam and they were now trying to take South Vietnam. And our leadership said, that's enough. I mean, it was obvious they were doing what their strategy says. The Soviet Empire had some 20 other nations in with them. And then they were taking North Vietnam, they had China, they had North Korea, they had all these other countries, and now they took, they were after South Vietnam. So our country made a decision to fight alone to stop them, okay? No help from Europe. We had a little help from South Korea and Australia, but it's generally the U.S. was fighting alone 12,000 miles around the world to stop these guys. Communists have spread like cancer through the world, and it is a cancer. Okay, mm -hmm. communism is pure atheism. Mm -hmm. It's truly bad. Okay, it's absolutely one of those things that you can say it's all bad. Mm -hmm. All bad. Nothing good about it. Okay, it's straight from Satan. Believe me. You know, when I face the interrogators, okay, they would say things like, as an example, this is a bottle. This is a bottle. Now, there'd be no reason for them to say this is a bottle. Okay. They know it's not a bottle, and I know it's not a bottle. Why would they say this is a bottle? They did this all the time. Because they were addicted to lying. They were slaves to lying. All they do is lie. They can't tell the truth. They would rather say this is a bottle than say this is a brochure. They would rather do that. Okay? It's, you, when you deal with them on a daily basis, you really honestly understand that Satan is behind communism. And when I say communism, I don't mean just communism. 
I mean socialism. Okay, this was Hitler. Okay, this was Soviet Russia. This is China. This is American liberalism. Okay, why is that communist? Because all a communist is is an atheist and a big government lover. I call them the Tower of Babel idiots. Okay, they are constantly trying to build a god on earth. What is this god on earth they're going to build? It's the government. And since they are the government, they are going to be God and tell everyone, not just how to do things economically, which they love to do through their regulations, but they're also going to tell you how to believe and they want your soul. Perfect example, their first attempt really to start that religious takeover, which they always do first, you know, as they're ready to take final power, is this whole idea of forcing Catholics, which is always their greatest opponents of these socialists, these government people, forcing Catholics to pay for abortions and contraception, okay? They know that this is a heart into the Catholic faith, and not, not the Catholic faith of the bishops and priests and also the Catholic believers. If they can get the Catholics to accept paying for abortion, mm -hmm. they got us, okay? And they know this better than we know it, because mm -hmm. right? they're fighting unified fights for 50 years to take this world. You know, their UN, the UN is their latest little game. You know, look at the UN. Is there any voting for the UN people? No, they love that UN being a world government where they're the only ones making the rules. And there's never any elections anymore. You know, the nice one world dictatorship, perfect. Perfect for these guys. Okay, when I look back, I see that when we made a decision to stop the Russians in Vietnam, it worked. The Soviet Empire, I should say, because it wasn't just Russia. Russia was leading it, but there was you know, many countries in that empire. It worked because what happened was is that they had to spend a lot of money to fight us. I was in Vietnam, South and North Vietnam. It was all Russia, okay? Vietnam was just uh, a proxy for them. All the equipment was coming into North Vietnam from Haiphong Harbor, which is the big harbor in North Vietnam. All the equipment and the food for the population also was coming in that way, okay? And all the ammunition, fuel, and tremendous supplies that it took. They had 350, if this is North Vietnam and this is South Vietnam, that next to those two countries there's Laos and Cambodia. And in that Laos and Cambodia border, which bordered on South Vietnam, this is all jungled mountain country, they had 350,000 North Vietnamese regular infantry. Six, eight divisions all the time over there. Okay, we weren't allowed to go over there and hit them. We had to honor that border, but they, they would constantly hit us and go back to the border to their safe area on that side of the border. Okay, we were not allowed to hit them. They also had about 500,000 guerrillas. These are civilians by day and fighters by night in South Vietnam. So they had about a million people. Those people, that's a million people have to eat every day. A million people have to have ammunition for their guns. A million people have to have rockets to launch on our bases. That all has to be carried by trucks and fuel and so on. Down through a thousand miles. That's like New York to Florida. That's what their supply line was, okay? Started out going across North Vietnam, but then it went down to Ho Chi Mail through those jungle trails, which was a mix mash of a thousand trails. And once they got over there, you couldn't stop them because it was all under the cover, under the jungles. And, you know, there was no way to hit them from the air. And remember, we weren't allowed to go in there and hit them from the ground. So the only place we could really try to stop those supplies is in North Vietnam. So at any rate, basically what happened is, is that they bankrupted themselves by the Vietnam War, according to all the Russian experts, which you never hear about in the press. Okay. We beat them militarily like a drum in the Tet Offenses of 1968. We killed all 500,000 guerrillas. Okay. And in the bombing of Christmas in 1972, we beat the devil out of them to, to the point where Giep, who was their top general, like our chief of staff, and also the top general against the French, said that they were one day away from unconditional surrender in the Christmas bombing of 1972. He also said he didn't understand why we didn't ask for unconditional surrender after the Tet Offensive. He says the only thing that saved him was the U.S. media. 
Walter Con Cronkite in the boys saying that the Tet Offensive was good for the communists. He said it had totally destroyed their entire infrastructure, all their guerrillas in South Vietnam. Okay, it's a case where we had the war absolutely won, and we negotiated it away. Okay? That's what really happened in Vietnam. But you've got the United States trying to fight Russia in a proxy war in Vietnam. This war bankrupted the Soviet Union. Was there a nuclear war between the United States and, and Russia and the Soviet Empire? No. No, there was not. Okay? Did the United States military want to drag that war out for 13 years? No. We wanted to hit these people over here. We wanted to hit North Vietnam. We wanted to invade North Vietnam. That was the source of the problem. Okay? The State Department, the politicians said, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. We might get a, uh, might spread or something, okay? So they didn't want to do that. Was it their idea to bankrupt Russia with Vietnam? No. So what happened here? What happened here is God beat the Soviet Empire. Is there a Soviet Empire today? No. Without a nuclear war. No. Okay? Does the United States stand? Yes. Okay? And it stands without a nuclear war because of Vietnam. So I always bring it out when I have anybody in the audience from Vietnam. Because I hate this liberals talking about, oh, you fought in a war that you was lost and all this kind of stuff. Okay. Number one, if anybody ever says that to me, like in the Legion or anything like that, any of the World War II reps still, still say that, I say, number one, I quote Giep, who's their top general, saying we beat them twice militarily. Okay. But the other thing I say is I say, look, even if we had lost... All the leadership of that war, all of it, was World War II generation, not Vietnam. Okay? Don't give me that crap. Okay? We fought fine. Right? It wasn't a problem of the soldiers, it was a problem of the leadership. You know? But again, the leadership would have been, it would have been terrible if the leadership did what the military said and blockaded Haiphong Harbor right at first. The war would have been over in a couple months. Okay? But then the Soviet Union wouldn't have been destroyed. See that? See how God does all this stuff that we don't understand? It's just amazing to me. The military being obedience to the civilians resulted in the destruction of the Soviet Empire, which was everybody's hope, without any nuclear war. Okay? Okay, in South Vietnam, I fought for about eight months with the 173rd Airborne Brigade. The 173rd Airborne Brigade is 5,000 airborne troops. These are extremely aggressive infantry soldiers. They're great soldiers, okay? The only thing you have to do is, as officers <laughs> with the 173rd Airborne Brigade is keep them, as soon as there's action, these are jungled mountains, very bad, very rugged, wicked terrain, okay? Extremely difficult terrain to fight in. It's close quarters, it's, you know, you can't see anybody five or ten feet away in the jungles. It's really close quarter fighting in every way you can imagine, okay? The only way that you can, if, when you get fired on, your trouble as an infantry officer with the airborne troops is to keep them from running after and killing the enemy, okay? Because the enemy is smart. Now, this doesn't, you don't believe this as an American kid growing up in the United States, because in the American kid growing up in the States, you watch movies, right? In the war movies, it's always that the enemy is, is terminally stupid and dumb, okay? And the American soldiers, or the good guys, are so smart and so lucky, it's unbelievable. But real war isn't like that at all. Real war is, is that the enemy is just as smart as you are, okay? So, what the enemy does when they're faced with an aggressive unit like that in the jungle, is they come up and they fire at your unit. And they hope that you string out and run after them. Now you have 200 men running after 10, okay? Meanwhile, they fortified positions on either side of the jungle trail up the, up the canyon here, a quarter mile or a half mile. And as you're chasing these guys down, of course, every time they'll stop and fire so that you know, you know you're on their trail, all of a sudden you've got 200 guys in an ambush by 200 guys on the side of you firing at you from point blank, from point blank range from bunkers, slotted bunkers. And your 200 good, aggressive Americans get slaughtered. Okay? So you just can't go running after people because they fire at you. You've got to be careful. These infantry units have to send out... Forward scouts, flanker scouts, rear, rear <coughs> scouts, 
always, just like armies have had to do for thousands of years, starting with the Roman army that we know about, for exactly this reason. If you're not careful, you're going to get ambushed and cut to ribbons. Okay? So, one of the things that they would do when they got an action against an enemy is attempt to determine where the enemy was and then they'd call in firepower, typically artillery. All right? And they always were under, <coughs> tried to always be under the coverage of artillery. Artillery is a tremendous friend, the infantryman's best friend. Okay, these are cannon fire. This is tremendous aid when you're in a fight with an enemy unit. <coughs> the other thing they try to do is bring in air power, like fighter strikes. Now, you can imagine, you're in an infantry unit, you have FM radio, you're the company commander, let's say, and you've got artillery coming in, and the artillery is on FM radio. And you can talk to the artillery with your FM radio. But there's fighters overhead, and all they have is UHF radio. It's a different radio. You can't get on those frequencies. It's different frequencies. How are you going to get those fighters to drop bombs on the enemy that you're fighting? What you have to have is some intermediate step, some intermediate uh, stage, so that you can get a marriage of the fighter-delivered ordnance onto the enemy that you're facing. Right? The Army has done the same thing with artillery for a long time. They talk about artillery observers being airborne in L-19 spotter aircraft, little Cessnas overhead, and the artillery observer will bring in artillery, and by controlling that artillery, the, the artillery officer and the spotter can make sure that hopefully you don't hit any friendly troops with the artillery. But that happens anyway. You always hit friendly troops sometimes mm -hmm. with artillery. You lose about one in six of your people, people like any man here or me by friendly fire. That's what happens in real infantry fighting. It's vicious, tough, close in fighting. When you start playing with guns firing on you, you know, from 10, 12, 15, 20 miles away, some of those, you know, artillery shells aren't exactly the same. They're going to hit some, they're going to hit short, especially as if there's real danger and there's a chance of being overrun, you bring that artillery as close as you can. <coughs> some of those rounds are going to come in close and hit friendlies. Okay? So, and with air power, it's the same thing, except we, you know, we try to be a lot more careful because we have much more control than guns do from you know, 15 miles away, right? And also, we have 750-pound bombs, and if we make a mistake, we're going to kill a lot of friendlies. So we have to be more careful than that. To control the, the bombs from the fighters, we had people up that were just like artillery men up controlling the artillery. We have fighter pilots in these little Cessna planes, like you see a little light plane in an airport. Okay, And we had little smoke rockets on our wings. So when we're up there, we would work with the company commander because we have an FM radio, but we always have a, also have a selector switch for U, UHF radio so we can talk to the fighters. Okay, So we can talk to the fighters, we can talk to the infantry. We can also hear both of them. We've got speakers from both of them. So that we would work with the infantry company commander and find out where they were. They would pop smoke, and you know we would wait till they popped the smoke because the enemy would pop smoke too because they're listening on these frequencies. When they popped the smoke, we'd call. We call. We say, "You know, we got red smoke." You know, and he said, "That's a firm red smoke." Meanwhile, over here, you might see blue smoke or whatever coming out where the bad guys are because they're trying to confuse the issue. But at any rate, finally, you know where the enemy, the good guys are, and let's say they are here lined up like this somehow, moving through jungled mountains. Remember, this is not easy stuff. Okay, and now here's the enemy, over here, as best you can tell. You know, they're giving you headings off here and so on, but you know, you're trying to figure out where these guys are. This is all jungled mountains. You can't see anything. You just see green trees down there. You know, it's not like, you know, oh, here's my flag. <laughs> you know, here's the bad guy's flag. Okay, nothing like that. Okay, so basically here, what you do then is you, in this little light plane, you have the fighters overhead. You bring them in overhead. They're ready, ready to go. You say, I, it's very important that. When you drop bombs in a fighter, these are dumb bombs, stupid bombs, not the smart bombs they have now, which go to within a few feet of where you aim them, because they're doing GPS or they're doing laser pointers. Okay, so the bombs go right where you ask them to go. It wasn't like that. We used to come in at you know four or five hundred miles an hour in a dive or greater speed, 600, 650 miles an hour, and we're on a dive to a target like this yellow plate. Okay, and we release that bomb, you know, at about 2,000 feet, and make a pullout. Like that, right? That bomb generally wouldn't go right or left. You can see that. You know, this is 750 pounds of iron. Stupid. Just when we hit the trigger, determines where that bomb goes. 
It's not going to do any adjustment. It's not going to look for this target like they do today. It's going to go long, or it's going to go short, or it's going to go on target, depending on how good the pilot is, if he's a rookie, if he's trained, how many missions he's had. Okay. So the thing that you can't do is if the good guys are here and the bad guys are here, you can't bring the fighters in on this heading. Because if it's a long bomb, you're going to take out your people. Or this heading. Or this heading. It's too dangerous. Okay? So you've never one got to know what you're doing or you don't put anything in. You got to know where the people are or else you just it's just too darn dangerous, you know? Cuz you're going to put in a lot of ordnance, you know, you're going to put in 20, 30 heavy bombs, you know, right where these bad guys are from a flight of fighters. So what you do is you say, "Follow me down a slot." Okay? On my heading. On my never mind 240 degrees, 23 degrees, so it's all too dangerous, okay? I want you to follow me down the slot and hit my smoke. Okay, so we're down, you know, 800 feet or so. So we dive on the bad guys here and fire a smoke rocket. So here comes a puff of white smoke in the jungle, right? Okay, so we keep pulling off and we keep going the same direction for a while. Just keep it <coughs> steady, right? And here comes the fighters right on our tail, okay? And they drop their bombs on here. And then we're, we turn to the side and then we adjust the... We adjust the follow-on bombs based on the hits that are going on now. Now we're controlling off the bombs instead of off our smoke. Okay? So each guy down the slot, one after the other, again, at 4, 8, 16, depending on how big the action is, all the fighters are dropping off that control. So that worked very, very well. And so what it amounted to was is that we had a lot less casualties than the enemy because we had heavy firepower on these guys. Now, after... That time with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, I volunteered for a low-level scout mission over North Vietnam flying F-100 fighter aircraft. A lot of it was the same. The same in the sense that our job was to get down low and not have any bombs with us, but just smoke rockets, and mark targets for the strike flights coming into North Vietnam. There was 100 fighters going to North Vietnam every day. Okay? Day after day, 365 days a year almost, for many, many years. A okay. hundred planes a day. We lost one a day on the average. And that was remarkable because they had, a hundred, according to intelligence, uh, an active 150 to 180,000 radar-directed anti-aircraft cannon, as well as all the SAM, the surface air missiles and so on. And these are guns, radar-directed pom-pom guns, like 37 millimeter, 57 millimeter, some 90s, 120 millimeter batteries and so on. And what they would do is, is they would track you on radar and then fire and put bullets in front of you. It doesn't work good against fighters though when they're turning all the time. Because once they fire their shell, it's going straight line. Now if you're turning all the time, how's it going to hit you? Okay. So now it's luck. So with luck, they'd shoot down one in a hundred, but we'd get 99 through a day. Okay. So, we, but those guys coming in here are coming in at 15, 20,000 feet, three, four miles up. They have to be fragged or targeted on fixed targets like roads, railroads, uh, railroad yards, uh, factories, all that kind of stuff. Well, that stuff had all been destroyed years ago. So they're just cutting roads over and over again, trying to knock out any bridges left. They'd constantly be doing, building new bridges, new temporary pontoon bridges, hitting them, all those kind of... They're fragged. These hunter guys coming in are doing that every day, right? But our commanding, off, uh, our commanding officer and founder, uh, Major Bud Day at the time, decided to have a unit that goes down there that would find targets like convoys. Remember those supplies I talked about coming in on the harbor of Haiphong? They would take them off a ship and put them on, let's say, 200 trucks. The convoys are 150, 200 trucks. Okay? So they put them on these trucks, all Russian trucks, everything Russian, everything's Russian. Their whole air defense system was Russian, Russian language. Okay? All their fighter pilots were Russian and East German fighter pilots. Okay? They were fighting the Russian Empire. They were fighting the Soviet Empire in Vietnam. Okay. These trucks would come down out of Haiphong, they'd go across North Vietnam, and they'd get in the Ho Chi Minh Trail complex, the jungles. Once they got to the jungles, we couldn't hit them or fi couldn't find them or hit them. Okay? But we could hit them across North Vietnam because the roads were fairly open. The roads were better than the roads in the jungles, but the trees were such that, that they, the trees weren't growing over the roads all the way like they were in Laos. So, but the trouble was in the daytime, they wouldn't be on the roads because they knew that if we saw them on the roads, I mean, from three miles up, you can see trucks on the road. If you saw them on the road, you're going to kill them, all right? 
So what they did was they'd sleep there in the daytime, and as, as nighttime came, they'd start their engines, warm them up. I was in these convoys, so I know how they travel. Start them up, and all night long, they'd travel. Of course, we knew that, too, with infrared cameras. We knew they were on those roads. I mean, you know, wall-to-wall -wall trucks all the time. So at any rate, you know, we, they would start their engines, travel all night long, and as it started to get light, they'd pull over to the side of the road. That was good enough. They couldn't go into jungles because they're too thick. They pulled to the side of the road, all right? And it was good enough to hide them from high-level guys, but not from guys low level. So we'd go in there right along the roads, you know, weaving back and forth, right on a deck. On a deck means as low as you can go. That means, in this case, on a treetop. If you were on a deck in a desert, you'd be right on the sand. If you're on a deck in the uh, water, you'd be right on the water, like five or ten feet off the ocean. That's how we came out of the east, you know, when we first crossed into North Vietnam every day. At any rate, basically, we go into the North Vietnamese country, and we look around for targets for an hour, low level, these convoys especially, and then we have our own tanker assigned. We're just, we're just one fighter, just one fighter, and we go and we hook up to a tanker. We take on a full load of fuel. We come back and go down low level for an hour and a half, looking for targets. Then we hit the tanker again a second time, and we go down for an hour, and then we recover in South Vietnam. Five and a half hour missions, three and a half hours under fire, low level in North Vietnam. Spectacular mission. This was all volunteers, 14 fighter pilots. Okay? Best group of men I've ever been with in my entire life. Bar none. End of story. These are the best. These are my heroes. These guys were good. Every man was a heck of a man. Okay, so at any rate, what we would do is we'd see a convoy now on a road, parked along the road, hiding in the daytime. Okay? So we'd call Crown, the control ship, Top Brass and Laos, say, please give us all your fighters. We had first call, first priority, because we'd have live, hot targets, good targets. We had first call on all fighters. Those 100 fighters going in, we had first call on them. Okay? So they'd give us the fighters, like 20, 30 fighters, for the next three hours. We were up there for quite a bit of time each time we went up. So they'd start throwing those, fi those fighters over to us. And when they got to our location, we would dive on the convoy put a smoke on the road right in front, okay, and the fighters would cut the road with a bomb, blow up the road. Then we'd dive on the back of the convoy, the road, put a smoke on the road, then they'd cut the back of the road, okay. Now we've got 200 trucks between two cuts in a row. They can't go sideways. About this time, all the drivers and any troops, there's a number of these trucks that are carrying troops, Start running like the devil. Doors all open. <laughs> running like the devil back in the woods. Because <laughs> they, sorry, sorry boys, had to wake you up. Because <laughs> they were sleeping, you know. So <laughs> go into the jungle. A lot of them didn't go into the jungle. We got them. They never participated in any fighting, okay? At the end of the war, after 10 years of war like this, to show you the, the, the magnitude of the victory that our military had in Vietnam, they had entire divisions of, 12, of uh, 13 and 14 year old boys. Mm. Entire divisions. Wow. Okay. We killed all their old men. And I'm talking old men, 20s, 30s. Okay. That's how vicious that war was and how violent it was. You have no idea how violent war is until you're in one and then you Nothing like the movies, absolutely nothing like it. You know, it's not one hour, two hours. It's many hours of heavy fire, you know, every day, you know. A lot of people hurt every day, both sides. <coughs> so, anyway, that was a job. We'd tear up these convoys, and as a result, you know, we cut down on some of the supplies and some, some kind of the ammunition and rockets that they could fire against our troop, troop down in South Vietnam. Uh, shortly after I started flying those missions, after about 10 of them, uh, I got shot down, rescued by the very brave men in the um, Air Sea Rescue Forces. We called them the bravest men in the world, the guys on the rescue choppers. We're coming in at 500 miles an hour, weaving like crazy in heavy gunfire. They'd come into the same fire at 150 miles an hour, <coughs> straight and level, not turning hardly at all. And they'd have two ships always because they uh, one, a lot of times one of their ships would get shot down in that fire, so they'd have to rescue the fighter pilot plus their own, you know, their, their partner crew there, okay? 
These guys we call them the bravest men in the world. Just no, no doubt, they were. In, in our opinion, they were. You don't get any braver than these guys. Uh, the second time, after six weeks, I was in the hospital. I got shot down. I was in the hospital for a while. I had some injuries. I got. I recovered, I started to fly again, and I got shot down again, this time low level, on the back, the, sh the shell hit just behind the cockpit, knocked out all controls. We were onto the deck at the time, strafing convoys, flipped over on the back and had to eject, you know, pull a handle into the ground, which was an interesting feeling. You know, you felt like as you squeeze a trigger, it looked like you're going to drive yourself head first into the ground, you know, because we're going down. But got a shoot okay, shoot open, slipped to a little patch of woods in the farm valley. By the way, as a, as a first, as a, as, as a shoot first opened, you know, you hear gong, 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 there's a farm villages all over this, this thing, like villages like this, you know. You hear gong, 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 gong. You know, again, I'm pretty stupid, but I understood those gongs are for everybody to get out and get us because you can see all the people come streaming out and, you know, closing on you as you're coming down, you know, and you're coming down in the chute. Now, I had the tangled risers, but I had a knife long enough I could cut the risers so I got a good chute. It was, you know, cleared the tangle in the chute, and I'm slipping for a piece of patch of woods, and you got soldiers running along next, below you, kneeling down and emptying AK-47 clips at me, some of them from 100, 200 yards away. So as I'm coming down, I said, guys, get this over with. This is ridiculous. You're a disgrace to manhood. <laughs> That's really what I thought. You're a disgrace to manhood. How can you miss from a kneeling position at 100 yards with an automatic AK-47? The bullets are whistling by me, but they're not hitting me. I felt like, come angels. on, this is ridiculous. You, you had know? angels protect God. you. Really. Pardon me? You yeah, oh, I, hey, listen, no, but I didn't know that then. See, when I got shot down, I was going to Mass every day, okay, but I wasn't praying every day, and I thought God was just controlling the big things. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. The best thing that ever happened to me was prison camp, because I learned about God's power, you know, yeah. honest. So, but anyway, I got to a thing, they captured me, and they, they, uh, brought me to a little holding camp, and a guy came into the holding camp with us who'd been evading for 45 days. He was starving. He was down to probably about 80 pounds. This guy's name was Lance Sijon, and they beat him to death, tortured him to death over the next uh, month, most of the time six feet from me. Okay? Couldn't do a thing to stop. My, my buddy and I were screaming like crazy all the time. Couldn't stop me. At any rate, um, we got up to the main prison camp, and now we're in pretty bad conditions. Conditions typically in prison camp, you got, you know, bare wall, concrete wall, cells, no windows, no doors, you got boards across, sole horses in the cell. You never get out, you know. Year after year goes by, you never get out. There's no recreation. You know, nothing like that. Okay. In the summertime you have bleeding heat rash by May. And then you have the hot months. June, July, August. You spend those months on the concrete floor, breathe in the 100 degree air under the door. Okay? That's how you spend all day. Like you ever see, ever raise guppies? You know how guppies, you ever screw up your water and the guppies start gasping for air at the top of the tank? That's how we work. Trying to get that 100 degree air. In the winter time, you'd shiver for up to a week, two weeks at a time. You know, in the cold spells, 30, 40 degrees, okay? Shivering, 24 hours a day. One thin blanket, two pair of pajamas, no socks, okay? No way to get warm. Absolutely no way to get warm. Of course, no hot drinks, no nothing like that. The, the water that you have, which is two liters of water a day, <coughs> that's enough. That's, the, the two liters of water is all, all, all for drinking, and there's no way to get it warmer. It's cold in the winter. It's warm in the summer, you know? They have nothing like that. You have two little loaves of bread. Bread and water is what we lived on those first three years. You have bread and water for... Uh, food, two, two of those little loaves of bread about this big, you know, and two liters of water, that's your food for the day. Lost, I was probably about 200 pounds and I was in perfect shape then, you know, I wasn't, didn't have all the extra weight I have on me now, but I, I was in really excellent shape, I was running six hours every night, you know, and so on, stuff like that. I mean, six miles every night, sorry, six miles every night. So I was in excellent shape and um, I, I went down to about 120 pounds, I probably lost, you know, 70, 80 pounds. And then the hunger, the hunger pains were for the first year. It took me that long to do that. I had hunger pains for a year, year and a half. Because, you know, the body's keeping losing all muscle and everything like that. And the body tells you, hey, you jerk, you're not feeding me enough. You know, I'm saying, all right, all right. You know, I can't stop. I, I, I don't need more food. You know, my body doesn't listen. Keep saying, you know, you stupid jerk, you're not eating enough. 
So finally, though, when you get down that low, now the bread is enough to maintain that weight, you know? The hunger pains go away. But the thirst pains in the summer don't go away. Thirst is worse than hunger. Thirst is really interesting. In the summertime, you're praying and meaning it. Lord, you know, I'll do anything if you just give me some cold. I'll never complain about the heat again. And then six months later, Lord, if you just give me some heat, I'll never complain about the heat again. <laughs> Every six months, <laughs> you'd switch your prayer. And you meant it. And I remember thinking at the time, this is amazing. How can this happen? How can I be so, you know, such a wimp? You know? Every six months, I switched my prayer. You know, no kidding. I really did. So at any rate, the, the cold, the heat, then in the bread, all kinds of rat droppings, hundreds in a, in a loaf. You can't pick them out, you know. You wouldn't have anything left. All kinds of worms, weevils, you know, you read about the sailing ships, all kinds of stuff in the bread, living, big ones. You bite in the bread, it bites you in the mouth. You <laughs> chew it, you don't want to eat it, because that's the only nutrition you have is from the stinking worms. Because the bread is just white flour, you know, it's little loaf of, loaves of French bread. So, you have the, uh, oh, and then the other thing is you only have one piece of toilet paper a day. I got one piece of toilet paper a month for two people. For two people. We had diarrhea the first two and a half months. So, you got to wipe yourself with your fingers. <laughs> the bucket overflows all winter long. We were allowed to wash out the floor of that cell one time in five years. Okay? You got raw sewage all over the floor. Right? But you can't wipe your hands on the floor. Plus, it's filthy, dirty. You're not allowed to sweep it or hey, It's just filth. You know? On the wall, so you got to wipe your hands on the wall. It's all under your fingernails and all this kind of stuff. You can't, you can't, you don't have nail clippers, you know. And so now you got to eat the bread with that hand. So after three years, you know, I'm talking to a commanding officer. You got terrible problems with parasites when you deal with raw, you know, poop like that. Okay. I'm talking to my commanding officer. He coughs, and four inches of a big worm comes out of his mouth. <gasps> this guy's name is Al. I said, "Cough, Al, cough," and I pull as he coughs. And I got a 12-inch intestinal worm in my hand, thick one, not an earthworm. This is an intestinal worm, okay? So he's still coughing. I said, Al, tickle your throat. You know, you may have some more in here. So he tickles his throat. He coughs. To make a long story short, in 15 minutes, I got a dozen of these things in my hand. I'm holding them by their body. The, they're all alive, you know. The ends are wiggling along. I'm looking at these worms. So I say to Al, because you had to be positive. Anybody complain, you know, you're liable to send somebody in to stop eating and die. People would lose hope and, you know, stop eating, die. Okay? So you didn't dare, you, you, you always hear about it in the books, you know, it's really bad when nobody dares complain. That's how it was. You didn't dare complain because you sent somebody off. He, he quit, you know, stop eating, die. Okay? So I'm saying, good, good, trying to be positive, you know. Good, Al, we got these suckers out of there, that's good. Or no, not in you anymore. Good, got those suckers. Meanwhile, I'm thinking in my mind, dear Lord, what do we do about this? Yeah. How do we fight this sucker, you know? I mean, we've been a lot of that, three years in, we've been in a lot of fights by that time. And I'm trying to think, how do we get through this? How do we beat this, you know? So at any rate, about two months later, another one of my friends, a guy named Tom, who'd been kicked very badly in the kidneys, like a lot of guys were, but he was kicked especially hard. It never healed, you know, and every two or three days he'd have horrible, horrible kidney pains for eight, ten hours, and blood in his urine all the time, and all this kind of stuff, you know, very bad kidney injuries. That's why they don't want boxers hit each other in the kidneys, you know. It's bad news hitting, getting hit in the kidneys. These are kicks, really hard kicks in the kidneys. So... Uh, at any rate, Tom doesn't eat a meal. Well, you can't not eat a meal. You know, you only got a little food. So I said, Tom, you didn't eat anything. He says, Yeah, that's that's the first step. The guy's gonna die. They stop eating. Okay. So I said, You know, you're gonna. He says, Well, I'll eat this afternoon. You know, I said, No. He didn't. I said, What about you know, you gonna eat tomorrow? He says, Yeah, yeah. Didn't eat in the morning. I said, Tom. He says, I'll eat this afternoon. He didn't. I said, Tom. He said, I'll eat tomorrow. I said, If you don't eat tomorrow, Tom, we gotta talk. You know. So he says. Okay, but yeah, you know, it's it's not that. I just so the next morning didn't eat. I said, Tom, let's just say, you know, what's what's kind of, what's happening here? I figured the pain of the kidney thing, you know, was made him quit. So I so he says, uh, I just don't feel like eating. I feel full. I just don't feel like you know. Take. I said, well, that's easy. Just tickle your throat. Get the obstruction out. You know, <coughs> so I got him a bucket. You know, when he tickled his throat, he fills this thing up with a, a thousands of little half inch white intestinal worms. Okay. Inch or two inches deep. You know? Then he could eat. I said, good. Got those suckers out of there. Now you're in good shape again. Okay? We had all kinds of tapeworms. 20, 22, 25 feet. 
I bragged because I was in a cell that had the 32-foot tapeworm. Record <laughs> no. 32 feet? 32 yes. feet. Now, these tapeworms, if you look at them, it's not that bad because they're thin, you know. But 32 foot, measured out. And you, to measure the tapeworm, you had to have, by this time we were in dungeons and we had three or four guys together, you had to have three measurements with three different foot sizes. So nobody cheated. <laughs> <laughs> this was important. You know, this, is, this is a major deal. Who has the longest tapeworm in their cell? Okay. Also, it was tough in the prison camp because we're bombing these guys. I told you they lost all their men. Okay. We're bombing these guys. We're bombing military targets, you know, roads, railroads, convoys, stuff like that, okay? Cross my heart, hope to die, scouts honor, okay? Like all you guys here, any of you guys like to bomb old women, children, and old, and old folks? Okay, how many of you guys would do that? Well, we were the same, we were Americans, okay? Not like these anti-war pukes would say, okay? We'd hit military targets. But whenever you're slinging iron like that around and bombs like that around at four, five, six hundred miles an hour, you know, you're going to kill civilians for sure. Okay? Collateral damage, call it what you want. There's going to be people die that are innocent. Well, their propaganda was hate Americans, hate Americans, hate Americans. And they would lose civilians, including men, you know, including old people, you know, women and children, like their propaganda always said, right? They would lose these people. Minor injuries compared to what it would have been if we were going after the civilians, but they still would lose people. So basically, and then you lose. These people were not happy. Would you be happy? Would you be happy in a war like that? Okay. You know, this was massive. This was real action. You know, this is a million men against a million men, and their, their whole country is 20 million. 20 million. 20 million. You know, we had 200 and something. They're fighting us with 20 million men. They're losing a lot of people. Motivated them to fight really hard. You can imagine how mad they were at us. We were pilots of fighter planes that were over, over and bombing, and we were the absolute epitome of evil in all their propaganda. <laughs> you know, we had, we had, in their propaganda posters, you know, we were, we were, the fighter pilots as we're coming in, we have these mean faces on, you know, so on. We're going to kill all your women and children, you know. This is what their propaganda is on every street corner and so on. Any Americans taken prisoner in South Vietnam were tortured and killed immediately. You know, bad tortures, you know, skinned alive, you know, cut up into little pieces and some very gross tortures that I won't mention to you because there's polite people here, okay? But that's how everybody was that we found. You know, they were horribly tortured and mutilated before they were killed. War is hell. This is why they say war is hell, because war really is hell. I mean, it's just unbelievable. You come out of war and you're in shell shock. You know, it's nothing like anything you ever experienced in peacetime. It's really brutal. It really is. Okay, now, about 3,500 air crew were shot down in North Vietnam, and only 472 of us came back. So, the Russians and the North Vietnamese tortured to death or killed six out of seven air crew. You know, one in seven made it back. Some died from giving up hope, but mostly it was being killed. Now, at this time, in, these tre in this treatment of us in prison camp, we were fighting in a Cold War. This meant that war was not officially declared by the United States against North Vietnam and vice versa. So we gave them, their soldiers, the protection of the Geneva Convention. The, when we captured their soldiers, we gave them Geneva Convention protection. They did not give us protection. Okay? They called us war criminals. So we can kill, you can kill you any time. You know, legally we have all our rights. You know, you have no thing because you, you haven't declared war on us, okay? So you're not soldiers as far as we're concerned, you're war criminals. You know, like terrorists, like we would treat terrorists, okay? You know how we would treat terrorists, okay? You know, you could treat terrorists, you can kill them, execute them on the spot, you know? Okay, there's no protection for a terrorist. Just like there's no protection for a spy. You know, Nathan Hale? That's never stopped. That's international law. You catch a spy, execution on the spot, okay? Because spies are so darn dangerous. If we were in a fight with Russia or China, and one of you was a spy, that would be really dangerous for this country. Okay? It's so dangerous that everybody understands. You track down and find a spy, you kill him right then. As a deterrent to anybody else being a spy, because you got spies in your own country, you're in deep trouble. You're really in deep trouble. 
with communism, this communism that I was in, I saw these guys, okay? The whole government is evil. Every one of them is evil. They have to sign a paper saying they don't believe in God. They're all atheists. They have to sign a paper saying they don't believe in God. Now, who, who has that rule? Who made up that rule? That's in all the communist countries. Who made up that rule? Okay. Is that a human rule? What human cares if another human signs that sign? Okay. Who's behind that little rule? Well, obviously it's Satan. Okay. So well, you don't know that. Oh, yeah? I think I know it. Because <laughs> I can't imagine anybody else being behind such a stupid, you know, soul-condemning rule. You know? And that's their rule in communist countries. Okay. You have to deny the existence of God. To a communist, the government is God. And since they are the government, they are God. You see how they each become God? That's why I call them the Tower of Babel idiots. They all really believe they can be God. That's what they are. And the reason they want to do that is because they want to rule. They want to control. And what they really are is vicious, thieving thugs and what they really want is to strip all the wealth of the country out of the people that made it and take it for themselves and their families and their friends. Mm -hmm. What they really want to do, okay? No matter what they say, it's always, we're going to help people. We're going to help the poor. We're going to help these people. We're going to help these people, okay? You know what I say is in a new constitutional convention after these jerks bankrupt the country, you know? The first rule in the Constitution ought to be, if any politician ever talks about helping people with taxpayer money that's extracted at the point of a gun from the people that it worked for, okay, the politician is immediately seized by all the people listening to him and hung by his ankles until dead. Okay, just to make sure that we don't get in this position ever again, you know. The United States is too good to give it away to these kind of guys. Everybody has to obey what the government says. Whatever the government says, any rules, there's no Ten Commandments. There's no morality. It's whatever they say, like in China, you can only have one kid and we're going to come and rip any other babies out of your womb. That's communism, okay? That's what they really, really want. In, in their opinion, all religions are superstitious and made up, but most important, religions give people the ability to resist their idiot rules, okay? Their mm -hmm. tyranny. It gives people hope that they can fight them because they've got God on their side. Okay? The government passes law, laws that they want because of their wants and needs, what they need to rule as an efficient dictatorship. Make everybody do what they say. And they don't want to just get it where you rule outwardly. They want to rule your souls and they want to rule your minds. And they don't want you to have any beliefs, or if you do, you better keep them hidden and not talk about them the conflict with the communist line on any issue, on any issue, okay? And if you do, they put you in torture for in interrogation camps, in prison. They call them re-education camps, but what they are is really torture camps until you agree, until you're broken and you give in to their idiot rules, okay, and their idiot beliefs. If, if you don't, then like I saw in North Vietnam, they take you and your whole family and your kids, like young kids, like, you know, eight-year-old kids, ten-year-old kids, and you pick through the garbage dumps until you starve to death as a family. All the jobs are by the government. That's why they love to get the jobs, like this you know, Obamacare thing where they get 20% of the jobs in the country. Okay, they love that because then they got total control under their bureaucrats and their regulators. Okay? This is what they want. They want those government jobs because then they got control over your family. If you don't do what they say, you're, you don't have a job anymore, buddy. And there's no welfare in the communist countries. There's no, you know, and, and I asked this guy, I said, why don't the other families help these guys and stuff? Because then he said, I said, who are, the, who are these families to the guard? You know, we were making coal balls for the for kitchen fire. You know, we're making coal balls. It's powdered, you know, the cheap coal you, is powdered coal, and you pat it together with water, make coal balls, and then you use it for for kitchen. Okay. So we were making kitchen coals, and the guard was over us. And, I, and these people are dumping, it's just on the outside of the camp wall. They're picking through the garbage. This is two little kids in this, uh, you know, 25, 30-year-old a guy and gal. And I said, who are they? He says, oh, people with bad attitude. <laughs> and I said, why doesn't somebody else help them and stuff like that? He smiles at me and says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, then they have bad attitude too. <laughs> oh. Okay? 
This is how they do it. They kill 10 million Russians like that, 50 million Chinese, and then everybody else buckles down. You know, we'd, we'd hopefully, hopefully everybody here would be dead, you know, in the first years, okay? But the other people would buckle down and live in this insanity, you know, where this is a bottle. Okay? That's really as insane as they are. It's so stupid, I, I just can't even conceive of it to this day. Okay. I mentioned this to point out the reason I fought in the war in Vietnam was to, was to stop communism. And this was a movement that, above all, is against religious freedom. Communism against religious freedom. Atheists and socialists against religious freedom. They hate it because it stops their dictatorship. Okay? The biggest trouble they've always had is the Catholic Church in every country they've taken. Okay? And a person with religious beliefs won't obey their laws when it says do something like kill your babies. You know, they just won't do it. So they have real trouble with this, so they've got to get them buckled down. They've got to take them out. I was a Catholic. I fought with soldiers who were other faiths over there. You know, there was other faiths in our army, in our Air Force, okay? Okay, but in a, in a communist country, there's no faiths allowed. No faiths whatsoever. They won't acknowledge that there's a God. And they force this belief that there's no God on every individual in the country. At least they better not say anything different. Okay? This really is a good thing for them because it gives people no way to fight them. It takes away all hope from their heart. Okay? And they become subservient, you know, lapdog slaves of the communist bureaucracy for the rest of their lives. That's what really, really happens. Do you see the similarity of what the communists were doing in Vietnam and, and, and what our government is trying to do? Okay. It's not by mistake, again, that they picked abortion to go after the Catholic faith. Not by mistake. Because if they can win this one, they got us. If we can't hold firm on this, what can we hold firm on? The worst murder, the worst sin there possibly can be, you know, is this, right? Is abortion. Taking a baby out of the mother's womb and killing it, okay? And if they can get us to accept this, they got us. Our government becomes extremely angry, angry, and the media does too, with anybody that talks about God publicly. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they become sneering and mocking, which is even more effective. So everybody's afraid to be a Tebow, you know? They hate this stuff. They hate it when you talk about God, because again, they're God wannabes. Whenever you think of a socialist, think of a God wannabe. Okay? This is not good. Our church is a major conflict now with the present government. Our church right now is in war with this government. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the same conflict that our country had with the communists. We don't want atheism. All right? Thank you. Thank you. I fought in a war to stop communism. Our church is now in a war with the government. The Roman Catholic Church is in a war with this government. Right? And it's because our church totally disagrees with the fact that our government allows and encourages abortion and don't want to be in any part, part of paying for that kind of thing. Okay? Again, there was no religious freedom whatsoever in North Vietnam. You know, if, I, if they caught me on my knees, then they'd torture me. Okay? Praying. they torture me. Right? That's the extent to which they'll go to. That's what, that's what it ends up with. Our country's leaders are apparently falling for the ploy of the communists and the socialists that are still around, just like they did on progressive income tax, you know. Oh, let's pray that the government fairly redistributes the wealth of the world. You ever hear that? Okay. The last thing you want is a government redistributing anything, because it really goes to their cronies. Okay. That's just an excuse to take all everybody's money and give it to their little cronies. That's what it is. Okay. So, at any rate, this, this has really been bought into by a lot of people who are communist or socialist one of these. They don't understand. They don't understand what it leads to. You're basically putting the government above God. You're not trusting God for your welfare. You're trusting in the government giving you a handout. Dangerous as a son of a gun. That's the way the tyranny is established. Okay, That's what they've done all over the world. People like Americans are so well-meaning they don't understand what's going on here. You know, they're looking for absolute power, guaranteed. It's the same kind of crowd, you know. 
They lie like crazy. The only time they're conservative is during the election cycle. Mm -hmm. okay. It's the only time. They haven't, they haven't, these atheist dictators, you know, in the background, haven't given up their job, these communist socialists. They feel this is what's best for them. And it is. It's bad. It lets them rule the world. Of course, it's only best for them until they die, you know. <laughs> then they don't even want to think. You know, nobody even wants to think about what's going to happen to them. And I'm not saying, you know, be mad at them. I'm saying pray for them. Just like Mary said in Fatima. Pray for them. They really need it. These guys are methodically trying to impose a dictatorship on the United States of America. That's why there's no talk in the Constitution and the contract. Okay? That's why they've taken it out of our education system. The problem is a lot bigger than the current leadership. The problem is socialism and liberalism and the education establishment. Okay? And throughout the school system, worst thing we ever did was let the government into education. Get it out. Support a full voucher system. You know, 10000 bucks for each family, for each kid. And uh, yeah. under control of the parent. 5000 for a good school, 5000 for a college fund. And if anybody wants to still go to government school, fine, let them. But that would be the end of government education. Because everybody would opt out. Okay? So that's what we have to do is get them out of education long term. But the problem with these guys is the problem they have is to have a one world government, you can't have religion. You've got to have everything leveled out. But this is really hard for them to do. Because God, you know, one of the reasons probably, he's allowed many religions to be in the world. You know, I'm a Catholic. There's people that are Jews. There's people that are Muslims. There's people that are Hindu. There's people that are Buddhist. These are major different belief systems, you know. Tough to level that out. Tough to get everybody to give up their beliefs. Okay, I believe that abortion is wrong because I'm a Catholic and there's tremendous numbers of religion that believe the same thing. The communists don't believe such. These atheists, these purely evil people don't. They legalized abortion a hundred years ago. Okay? And, you know, Putin just recently said, if, and, there's, and Putin is an absolute atheist. He was a communist KGB torturer, professional torturer. He's a thug, a real thug. And even he just said three or four years ago, if Russia doesn't stop abortion, Russia is finished. Mm -hmm. Because their population is going from 120 million down to 50 million over the next 80 years. They can't have any kids. You know, they get eight, six, seven, eight abortions per line. Okay. Okay. But these then, communists, these Russians, have convinced most of the world to go with this abortion, including our own government. The most idiotic thing in the world, of course, is to allow abortion. And they've convinced us to do it. I mean, it's amazing. How can you be a reasonable human being? And what I tell any liberal that supports this stuff is I say, would you please go watch one? So you know what you're facing when you die? You're going to have to meet God with that belief. Make sure you know what you believe. Go watch an abortion. Then come back to me and tell me it's okay. Just watch one. It's a great one. Okay? What are we to do? Well, we have to keep doing what we have to, been doing for the last 40 years ago. It's had a great effect. Most of the American people realize abortion is wrong. Much different than it was 30, 40 years ago. It's in the awareness. We have to protest, convince everyone we can that abortion is wrong. We can't let down the efforts. The bishops, the bishops are our leaders. We're in a war. They're the generals. They'll tell us what we have to do about these new laws. When they tell us what to do, number one, we pray for them because it's going to take real courage to fight this fight, okay? Because they're going to lose all kinds of money if they do it right. You know, they've they got to forget money. They've got to forget everything else. They've got to forget political influence. They've got to forget going to the big parties, okay? They've got to fight this fight, okay? So yes. they need prayer to have the guts to do that, all right? Now, at the, at the same time that they have the guts to do that, when they fight, we have to obey. Obey the bishops. Perfect obedience. The bishops have to be able to act as one. Just take it to, to an extreme. Say there's 60 million people that vote with the bishops. Okay? 60 million Catholics obey the bishops perfectly. That's the end of abortion. So all we have to do, obey the bishops. Critical. The, the liberals constantly strive to, to, to split up the clergy from the believers. They constantly have a million reasons. They're too liberal. They're too conservative. They have a, they have a million techniques to break the believer-bishop bond. Okay, We have to stick with the bishops. 
in perfect obedience. They're our generals. They have the responsibility to lead this fight. We have to support them. That's our responsibility. We have to obey the government laws. We have to obey a lot of other laws, but we have to obey above all those bishops when they tell we gotta, us how to fight. We gotta stay them. We gotta pray too. And the rosary yeah. would be a damn good way to start it. I'm telling you. Yeah. I'm sick and tired of this communist kind of stuff. Dude. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, killing babies. Yeah. Cut their heads off. Cut their arms off. You don't ever see that. I got pictures in my wallet to show you. Yeah. No, I believe it. You know, I listen to China. You know, they. It's. It's. It, I. It's. It, I don't even want to talk about what they're doing in China. It's here in America too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. oh yeah, I mean, you know, there's no doubt of that. But you know, don't 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 worry. You know, God wins this fight. He's going to win it big time. He can yeah, win it any time he wants to. Yeah. Okay, so we've got to do what we can do, and we've got these new laws to fight, and we can do that if we obey the bishops, because we got to stay united. In the Air Force, a really fine man. So he was talking about Air Force Academy grads, which I am, you know, in the Air Force being ring knockers and having all this arrogance and all this kind of stuff, right? You know, like the reputation of the West Pointers in Annapolis and so on, okay? So he was talking about that, and I said, Well, what'd you call those guys and so on? So he said, Well, what we called them, he was a non Academy grad, see? Okay. So he says, What we call them was self licking ice cream cones. <laughs> self licking ice cream cones. I love it. So what I do every morning is I say, Lord, please help me not to be a self licking ice cream cone. Okay? Because that's the truth. I mean, that's the basis. All these spiritual I'm trying to you know, I'm trying to read all these spiritual books because I only got a few years left. You know, and the then the level in heaven is based on how much grace you have on earth, you know. So I, you know, I've got to play catch a big time, you know. So I'm trying to read all these spiritual books, so they all say, don't even think about the other virtues until you get humility down. I said, how the heck do you get humility down? Well, you got to get humility down to have total trust in God and, and honest, you know, realize that you have nothing yourself, you know, that you really are just a create, created, a, you know, being, and you, you just don't have anything yourself. But i got another suggestion. This is another way to be pro-life that we can do right now. Every group of Catholics can do this. This is in addition to protesting and speaking out. We, of course, don't want to start stop that. I'd like to tell you about how, where I live, a group of families and individuals have been pro-life in this way. And again, you can do it right here. And the government can't stop it. About 15 years ago, a Catholic married couple moved to the place where I live. They came from New Jersey. She was working as a daycare center. He had worked for Toyota, uh, overseeing dealerships in the New York, New Jersey area. They moved from where they lived in New Jersey to where we are in Ohio. He got a job, and you know they soon had another child. A group of us started to help them out as best we can. This is a group of other families, you know, they're starting to help them out. And, you know, we had our kids were generally uh, grown. We had a little bit of resources that other other families did. We were all pro-life in this way, helping this pro-life, this young pro-life family. This couple believed in the church's teaching that a couple should be open to life. You know, no planning, none of this contraception, none of this stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. they're just planning it right. You know, letting God plan it, letting God schedule. He knows what He's doing much better than we do. Here's how we helped them out. You know, first when they arrived, and over these last 15 years, a man who had lost his wife when he became a fervent, fervent Catholic because she thought because she didn't like this Catholic stuff, and she applied for a no-fault divorce and divorced him. And you know, he's faithful to her. He's staying in. He, Writes her a letter now and then saying, Honey, anytime you want to come back, I'm, I'm going to wait for you till I die. Okay? But he, he got some goats and he started milking the goats and he started giving his family some goat milk, which you know is a very good food for human beings. It's like mother's milk. He's done that now for over 10 years. Another man and woman who retired from Catholic Relief Services, and by the way, they worked with Mother Teresa for 11 years before anybody heard her name in India. Mm -hmm. And they worked all over the world, South Seas and so on, and Korea, and every Korea right after the Korean War. You know, it was really bad there. They'd raised four children on their own, and they were very good gardeners, and they gave these people all kinds of eggs and vegetables on a regular basis in season, right? The man with the goats and a, another guy who has goats, they go hunting for deer a lot. They get the deer, and they bring it to this guy, and he would slaughter, he would, you know, butcher them and have plenty of meat, boil down the bones for broth and so on for his kids and so on. Another older couple had six children, retired doctor, retired nurse. They let him take all the firewood he wanted off their 100 acres of woodlands, you know, so he didn't have any fuel bills in the wintertime. Also let him use their trailer and a truck to haul the firewood over to his house. All his food and fuel meant the couple could afford to live and still have more kids without getting hung up on that stuff. 
It's been 15 years now. They just had their 10th child this year. Probably the last one because probably the last one because the, the mother is 45 years old now. They've been living in a small house. Our group has recognized they need more room. One of the uh, people bought a, a farmhouse, a large farmhouse, but they, through the internet dating service, met a Catholic girl in Canada, moved up there, and they're living in Canada and now. They just had their first child, but now we got a farmhouse sitting empty. So we started paying a mortgage on a farmhouse, you know, so that took the burden off those guys. We also started to pay the expenses of this 10-child family so they could, so the guy could work full-time. He's been working a year on it now. He's almost done on redoing the farmhouse so they can move into it. Wow. Once he's done, then he'll get a normal job and have a big, nice, large house to move in for very little money. We also <laughs> plan to help assist him have a garden and a small barn. We'll help him with, we'll help him with money for the uh, materials, but we'll also help him with the labor to help build it. Okay. He'll be settled on the land, have a place to raise his children. Mm -hmm. All are Catholic and all are, ho are being homeschooled and have been homeschooled their whole lives. Recently, two of the boys were invited to a dinner by the bishop to talk about a vocation to the priesthood. Mm. It's always been true, you know, that the uh, large families are the cradle of vocations because the big reason, the biggest reason that God wants big families is because you have tremendous love when you have, you know, mm. six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fifteen kids. Tremendous yeah. love, okay? Because, you know, lo divine love is giving, caring, sharing, okay? Mm. Hard to be selfish when you've got ten brothers and sisters. Mm. You know, you've got to work together. Also, the mother is real trouble feeding, you know, ten kids. So the kids have to learn to work, get off, get out of the seats, get out of the video games, get out of the TVs, get up and do some work, okay, if everybody really wants to live well. So there's really very few selfish people coming from large families, okay. You get a family with one kid, you got danger, real danger. Okay, there have been many sacrifices made to help this family over the years, but I believe this is the answer for the church. I really believe this is an answer. Because it's so expensive to raise a large family this day, everybody here knows what I'm talking about. I think in every family there's parishes who really do want to be serious Catholics and have real good large families. I think the parish pro-life committee should somehow get involved in an attempt to help them. Then the aid could be, you know, the aid could be anonymous. Nobody wants to know who's giving, you know. What's like. Many people in a parish would volunteer their time to grow vegetables, crops, or chickens, or goats if they knew that the food was going to go to a, a sincere Catholic pro-life family. On the same note, every parish has people in them with real means. They're thinking about buying a condo. They don't know what to do with the money and so on. You can help families like this pay the bills, schools. Uh, you could let them have a large house, maybe pay for good schools for their kids or fuel bills, whatever. A pro-life family could make their no needs known to the, pro to the uh, Respect Life Committee, and they could put that out in a bulletin or whatever, and then anybody could, you know, anonymously help with these needs that these people might have. Okay, think about this way we just talked about. This is a very positive way, something, you know, additional to be pro-life. It's a way that everybody can help in their own parish. It's a way the government can't stop, okay? It doesn't cost any, any uh, uh, more than entertainments or something, and, and we can really help people that really need to help. You know how it is when you're in your 20s and 30s with a lot of kids. I fought for life many years ago, and I'm going to fight for life right now. It's a different war now. The war is against me, my own selfishness. So my selfishness says to me, Guy, keep that money for me. Keep that money for me. Spend it going to Florida. Spend it going to restaurants. Have a good time. Get better furniture. Get better cars. Get a new truck. You know, get all kinds of things, okay? Myself says to me, don't help others by spending time raising vegetable crops or milking goats or whatever. That's their problem. You know, he's a father of the family. He's got that responsibility. Let him do the work. Don't help him. I have to war against the selfishness. I have to give him my treasure and time to be pro-life. This is a Christian thing to do. It's a concrete way to help my neighbor, especially a good, young, you know, pro-life Catholic family. It's a commandment of my leader, Jesus Christ. I'm supposed to listen to Jesus. He says, help people. By the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, and through prayer, I'll win this war. I'll fight a good fight. I'll fight for life where I live by helping families be pro-life. Thanks to each one of you people for coming today. I understand from Jack how involved you are in many, many ways. You're fighting by demonstration, speaking out courageously, helping women bring children to term, prayer, and many other ways. I hope you also join in this fight in this additional way that we found in a way that can really help young pro-life families be able to make it in this world.
Thank you. Thank you.